Oh, one of the things that I've learned about going shopping and traveling, <laughs> wait, hold on, there's, there's more to that, <laughs> and traveling with a toddler is to make sure to have snacks. How many of the moms know what I'm talking about? Maybe even some of the dads, right? <clears throat> See, we were on our way to um, California earlier this week um, with Charlie Joy, and it had been a little over two hours already, and it came to the last 10 minutes of the flight, and she starts signing outside. That means she's had enough of being on the plane. She wants to be outside. And so I said, well, Charlie, we're going to have to wait. we got to wait, Charlie. And then she's like, outside. You know, like, I, maybe you're not understanding what I'm trying to tell you, Mom. So let me, let me sign for it one more time, right? And so um, when I told her again that she had to wait, um, her little whine cry started to happen. And I don't know if you've ever been on a plane with a toddler who's had enough. But I was like, you know, I went, I started like panicking. I was like, oh no, redirect, redirect, come on, come on, redirect. You're good, you're good this. You can do gentle parenting. You got this, you know, like. And so, so I started panicking, but I was like, what can I do? And I was like, oh, 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 Charlie, would you like to have some yogurt or an apple? And then she, her eyes got wide and she smiled and she's like, apple, you know? And I was like, yes. That was close, you know, like we almost had a meltdown. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy and the snacks. So snacky snacks have come in handy in my life with a toddler. And um, how many parents, you're good at packing your kids a snack or a lunch? You just know, like, I need to make sure that we're packed up for the day or you're on errands so you know the only day we're going to survive is if there's enough snacks, right? So you know. Well, you have learned that it helps. Well, in the story that we're going to read today, there is a young boy whose lunch keeps the disciples of Jesus from having a meltdown. See, the disciples are with Jesus, and the story starts with the author addressing the Jesus followers, the disciples, as apostles. And see, that word apostle means those sent out. And they had just returned after Jesus had sent them out to go two by twos to preach. And they, it says they had, they had preached, they had cast out demons, they had anointed the sick and healed them. So in this story, they are back again with Jesus. And they're excited about everything that they've done. So Jesus says, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go to a deserted place and invited them. Let's go. Let's go to a remote place so that we can rest. Because rest is good for you and it's important. So Jesus is trying to get them through them. So they get on a boat and they head off to a remote place. And as they're doing that, people see them. And they're like, wait, we see you. We know who you are and what you're about, Jesus. So they start running. And there must have been some athletes up in the villages in this town because they got there before the boat. Either they ran really fast or the disciples were like, row, row, row your boat slowly down the stream. Because they knew the minute they got there, they're going to be on once again, right? I don't know. I don't know what it was, but... I love that it tells us the people got there before Jesus and the disciples. So let's pick up the story in Mark chapter 6, verse 35. It'll be up on the screen if you don't have a Bible or a Bible app. But Mark 6, verse 35, it says, it's kind of a long story, so hang in there. If you've not done Bible reading this week, we got you covered. Okay, here you go. It says, by this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? 
he asked, go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave things, broke the loaves, and then gave it to the disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. And it says that they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish, and the number of men who had eaten was 5,000. 5,000 men had eaten. Now, I always, you know, if you've wondered, like, why does it say men and doesn't include, like, the women and the children in the group? Well, the culture back in the day is the men were the ones out and about, so they were the ones mostly present for all these things. But women, we count, so don't worry. Um, you're in there too. And anyway, so, so they, tell, they, get, they give us this big number, and this story is found in all four Gospels. All four Gospels, along with the resurrection story, are uh, the story, you can find it. And the account that we read is in Mark, but there's an account in John 6 where John, um, the author of John, he, he's, he's giving us these details, and there's a detail that he puts in there that's important for us to know, and it's this. The five loaves and the two fish came from a young boy. Good job, Mama. You packed his lunch that day, right? Good job. Um, but today, I, I want to make a couple observations of this passage and allow God's word to speak to you. And one of the first things that I see is that Jesus is not faced by the problem we face. He's not faced by the problem we face, right? And the disciples, they realize, like, we're in a remote place, right? We heard him, and they realize it's getting late. It's going to get late. These people are hungry. They need to go back to their places. They're going to need strength for the road back home. DoorDash, Uber Eats, it's not going to make it out here. So they're trying to solve it, right? They're, they're trying to figure out a solution. So their solution to the problem was, okay, Jesus, send the people. So that they send the people away so they can go to the surrounding towns and they can figure it out on their own. They can figure out how to buy food for themselves. <clears throat> but this is my first or second observation that I want to say to you. Only because it's a solution does not mean it's God's provision. Sometimes you and I, and I love, yeah, thank you for the response. I love that um, <laughs> You know, Jesus gave us a brain. We're supposed to think. We're supposed to come up with solutions. That's, that's what our brains do. Our brains love solving problems. So I'm not saying don't use your brain. Please use your brain. But I'm saying only because it's, solution, it's a solution that we came up with does not mean it's God's provision. When I was a young adult, I made a really, really dumb mistake. And see, I really needed a car to get from home to school, which was really far, and to get to work. And so I decided, oh, I need a car. And mom and dad said, you know, I, I think you should wait. I don't think you should get a car yet. You need to have a little more income. And I was like, no, no, I need a car. So then one of my friends said, well, I'll lend you the money. And I was like, great. Yeah, lend me the money, you know, enough for a deposit. And so they did, and I went to the car dealership and, of course, got a loan to get a used car, um, which I still didn't have enough. So I, I ended up having to go into debt to buy this car, which a month later I ended up totaling and having to still pay the debt on it. So for me, that was a very, it's a good solution, Ilsean kind of, but really was it God's provision? No, I found that the hard way. It was not God's provision. But I do appreciate the disciples go to Jesus with their problem. So I just want to encourage you, whatever's going on in your life, just keep going to Jesus. Even if you think you know the answer, keep going to Jesus with the answer, and he'll, he'll let you know. And part of me wonders, um, was it because they were hungry? Because in verse 31 of this, of this chapter, it says that so many people were coming and going that they did not have time to eat. So maybe this solution was driven out of hunger, right? We don't know. Sometimes hunger makes you do crazy things. Um, but at the start of 2024, we said this, and we, that, that we wanted to see God do new things. We wanted to see the new things that God is already doing in our community, in our families, in our life, and in our church. And I want to tell you that for you and I to see God make 
a new way, a way in the wilderness, and it'll create a river in the wasteland, it will require dependency on him. It will require dependency on him. Because sometimes we think we know. But man, I was talking to someone this week and I was reminding them, you know, dimly we see is what the Bible says. We have this dim perspective and we, the only one that can see the full picture is God. So it requires dependency on him. So think about it. The disciples were probably hungry and they were thinking, you know, these people are probably hungry too. We need to eat. They need to eat. It's late in the day. And if they don't go now, someone's going to have a meltdown, right? And so it made me think though, it's in this remote place, but what if It's in this remote place, the deserted place the disciples wanted to get away from. What if it's in this deserted place and then this remote place, the last place that you think God could ever work a miracle? What if that's the place that God is setting you up to partner with him for his miraculous provision? What if he wants to partner with you in the most deserted place. And that's where God wants to meet you. He wants to show you what only he can do through you. Because I love that Jesus could have done it, but he involved and included his disciples. See, these men, the disciples, were on mission with Jesus. And that is what being a follower of Jesus is. It is someone who is on mission with him. In this mission, it's about loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And sometimes we, we're good at the one part, kind of, sort of, but then we're not very good at the second part. We forget that that part is in there. But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Jesus puts it back on them. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. They come to Jesus with the problem and with the possible solution. Jesus says, no, that's not the solution. You, you do it. You give them something to eat. And in the account of John 6 in the story, it says that Jesus asked Philip, He said, feed these people, and he did it to test him because he already had in mind what he was going to do. I love that about Jesus. He's like, I already know how this is going to go, but I want to see what you you do. I want to see how you trust me right now in your life. I want to see. So let me test you in this. And he does, and he tests Philip, and we see that their response is a very earthly, very human response. And they said, man, it would take more than a half year's wages. Some other um, accounts say eight months' wages. And they say, are we to spend, go and spend that much on bread and give them to eat? In other words, Jesus, this expense is ridiculous. You are expecting us to spend this much just to feed all these people? And um, it brings me to the second observation of the story, which is this, being on mission with Jesus means learning to be generous with everything. If you're going to be on mission with Jesus, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, we need to learn to be generous with absolutely everything we have. See, and they see how impossible and absurd it is for them to give to these people all the food that is needed. But I love that Jesus asked them this question. So no matter how hard it is in your life, no matter how impossible it seems, don't stop talking to Jesus about it. Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? And then he tells them, go and see. Go and find out how many loaves do you have? And it says that they found out that they had five and that they had two fish. And so they brought those things to Jesus. The little that they had, they brought to Jesus. And the story continues that Jesus directed them and gave them instructions how to sit and who distributed what. Jesus directed them. And I want to remind you of this. That 
Generosity is not dependent on what you have, but what you give. See, this young boy, he gave all of his lunch. He didn't give them one fish when he had two. He gave them all the fish. And he didn't say, well, I'll keep two loaves and give you three. That's what I would have done. I love bread, you know, but I would have kept two, especially if I'm hungry. But no, no, this boy gave all of his lunch, trusted Jesus with all of it. And we see the disciples, but what good is this misly little lunch to feed 5,000? It makes no sense how something so little could be used for so much. But that is what the kingdom of God is about. You know, if I were to ask Charlie to let me have one of her pouches when she's hungry, one of her snacks, she loves crackers. If I were to say, Charlie, give me one of your crackers, she would whine and she would cry. And I think sometimes that is also the reaction we have when we're asked to give what we have. One of the authors that I'm reading um, this month, she says, every single one of us has an inner toddler. Every single one of us. And sometimes we let the toddler win out. No, I'm not sharing. No, I'm not going to give that, you know. I want what I want, and I want it now. And I want it all for me, you know. And so we all have this inner toddler because our nature is to be selfish. That's the reality of it. We all, that is the one thing that we're really good at. We're really good at being selfish. And that's why we got to trust Jesus to make us a new creation and to help us surrender and learn how to be selfless. But see, in this story, this young boy sacrificially gives, showing that generosity does not require excess, but a sacrificial heart. It required sacrifice. Generosity is a matter of the heart, not of your wallet or your bank account. Generosity is abundant and lavish and overflowing. It's not just leftovers. And the greatest expression of generosity is God giving his one and only son because he loved you. That is the greatest expression of generosity that you and I see. And there's a quote that says, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Love is what motivated God to give to us, and love is what should motivate us to be generous. So you have an assignment this week, and it's to do what Jesus said, to answer the question, what do you have? Go and see. What do you have that Jesus needs you to surrender to him so that he can work in ways that only he can to bring about miracles in our lives? See, in giving to Jesus, he will give direction. And I love that he directed them and told them, okay, this is what you're going to do. Groups of 50, groups of 100. And then he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. And in that, right, he, he blessed it. He gave direction. And he also led them to green pastures. Notice that it says they were sitting in green grass. I love that they mentioned that because it reminds me of Psalm 23, that Jesus is the good shepherd. In Spanish, that psalm begins, Jehová es mi pastor y nada me faltará. He is my shepherd and I lack nothing because he provides for you. And whatever you have, surrender to Jesus ends up being enough. See, when we give it to Jesus, we say, thank you, God, because you're the one that provided. When we give it to Jesus or trust Jesus with what we have, he blesses it. 
And one of the reasons I give a percentage of my income to God through the church is because living off 90% of my income with God's blessing is always better than 100% without it. And that's just a principle that I'm choosing to live my life by. And maybe for you, giving a percentage of your income to the church is something you've never done. Maybe you've thought about me being on mission with Jesus and responding to being on mission with Jesus. But you think it doesn't require giving. Friend, being with Jesus requires giving. So much more than finances. You give of your time. You give of your talent. You give of your treasure. See, a good way to know if you're trusting Jesus is by going and seeing what do you have and are you being generous with it? Because everything in our life that we have, God will ask us to surrender to him. So how will we respond? Like in toddler on a plane ready to melt down? Or will we respond with faith and trust. I don't see how it's possible, God, to feed 5,000 people with this little bit of food. But you know what? Here it is. Let me bring it to you. Because in giving it to you, there is something that happens. The kingdom of God comes and makes it more than enough. So this year in 2024, I want to invite you to trust God in new ways, and let's practice faith as we live out generosity. <clears throat> and for me, it is because, you know, um, we were talking to a pastor, and he's saying, man, I've been tithing since I was like four years old. My grandma would give me a dollar, and I knew that 10 cents would go in the offering plate, no questions asked. Like, it was just something that I grew up doing, and I'm still doing. He said, so for me to be able to give with faith, it requires me to be sacrificially generous. So my prayer for me is that this year in 2024, I would trust God in new ways and find new ways to be generous in all that he has given me. Not because he needs it, but because I want to love God with all that I have and love others in the same way. Would you close your eyes right where you are? And Lord, my prayer is that you would help us to trust you. Lord, you know what your people need. You, you saw the crowd and you had compassion on them. And you provided for them through what that little boy had in the disciples' obedience. So, Lord, I pray, would you give us the faith to try trusting you this year in new ways? Whether it's in our finances, whether it's in our time, giving of our time to volunteer, to serve you, to serve the church. Or whether it's giving, Father God, of a talent that you've blessed us with that we've kind of just kept hidden because... No one needs to know. Lord, I pray. Would you help us be generous with what we have? Would you move us in new ways of faith to trust you like we've never trusted you before? Lord, we want to see you working miracles. It's not something you did back then, but something you are still doing now. So, Lord, help us to trust you in new ways of working in our lives. And with everybody's eyes closed, <clears throat> I want to invite you, if you're here, and maybe up to this point of your life, you've not trusted Jesus with your life, you've not put your faith in him, but today, that is something that you want to do. Maybe as I've been talking, you've been asking yourself, really, does God really love me that much that he would give his son? Yes, God 
loves you. So if you're here in the room or online, and today you want to make a decision to put your faith in Jesus and follow him, I want to invite you right there where you are. Would you look up at me so that I can agree with you in that decision? He loves you. He is for you. He wants to make a way for you. Father, thank you that you are good, that you are faithful, and that you give us an opportunity to follow you. Lord, help us to be a generous people and help us to be the generous church that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name.